In the headlines, a local fast food restaurant, Chafet, creates quite a buzz in New York. A dental school to be established in Barbados shortly. Barbados on course to meet the December 2025 target to be trans fat free. And in sports, the Windies take an unassailable lead in their ODI series with the UAE. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC News Night, starting now. Good evening, I'm Shane Seeley, leading the news at 7. Local fast food chain Chefette Restaurants created quite a stir in Manhattan, New York today. The online buzz before its arrival translated into thousands of people lining up along Bryant Park to savor the flavor. Wendy Burke has been following the story and tells us more. Take me to Chefette. The local restaurant's old jingle was in full effect in Manhattan where thousands of people stretch for blocks in a line leading to a fully branded food truck. Celebrating 50 years as a company, Chefette has partnered with the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated, BTMI, Export Barbados and JetBlue to make this lunch date possible. It was a welcomed opportunity for many Bajans and others from the diaspora, along with New Yorkers, to get a taste of the iconic restaurant's menu. On offer were rotis, wingdings, chips and pizza. Chefette's marketing officer, Hillary Williams, said they anticipated lots of support, but today was tremendous. We're here at Bryant Park, New York City for the Chefette pop-up food truck event alongside the BTMI, Export Barbados, Chefette Restaurants and JetBlue. There's a lot of action happening here today. The food is flowing, the roti smell delicious and someone has actually recently just won the first free flight compliments of JetBlue straight to Barbados. So we're so thankful for the turnout that we have here today and we cannot wait to head to Copley Square in Boston this Thursday. UC Skeet, director of the BTMI USA office, told CBC News that it was about more than the food. The interest parked is expected to generate more visitor traffic for the Food and Rum Festival as well as other events. It is known that JetBlue is New York's hometown airline. So I think the strong affiliation with JetBlue on this promotion and the fact that they're seeing that they have these multiple options relative to flights out of JFK to Barbados has been really, really uh, encouraging. Uh, we've also seen already for the day, uh, individuals who work in some of the office buildings here in uh, the city where we're located across from Bryant Park, who've come down specifically to get more information about the destination. But we've actually had an employee from one of the financial institutions here who's already uh, reached out to our travel agent partner about a group uh, for the Food and Rum Festival. So we are really seeing this partnership with JetBlue and Barbados paying off significantly. Wendy Burke, CBC News. Now to news from Parliament. It's from there that we hear that Barbados will soon be home to an international dental school. Our Wendy Burke joins us live now with the full story from the lower house. Wendy? Yes, Shane, what I can tell you is that the location earmarked for the institution will be Harrison, St. Lucie. Government, through a resolution brought by Minister of Housing, Lands and Maintenance, Dwight Sutherland, moved to acquire 9.024 acres of land at Harrison Plantation in St. Lucie for the public purpose of education, economic and tourism development. The land being acquired will add another parcel, some 74 acres being sold by the Barbados Tourism Investment Incorporated to accommodate the school. Minister Sutherland welcomes the proposed school, noting the investment is worth some $57 million. He expects the dental school will boost the economy. This really starts with the Ministry of Housing, but the reality is this is a matter that will generate employment, create growth, educational tourism. There are several boost industry boost our healthcare sector, foster linkages between the University of the West Indies, student enrollment, and world-class state-of-the-art technology in dentistry. That is what is coming to this country. And this project is intended to start this year. 
Minister Sutherland further revealed the dental school will comprise a six-storey student residence with several amenities. Such as restaurants, laundry, gym, games room, convenience stores, and a hotel. So, Mr. Speaker, we are not only looking at dentistry, but we are focusing on educational tourism. Because with that dental school, the hotel will cater to the parents of the students and overseas patients and visiting faculty members who will stay there. This certainly will boost our economy. In her contribution, Minister of State in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, Dr. Sonia Brown, expressed optimism the dental school will fill voids that currently exist in dentistry locally. She wants officials to ensure local students are accommodated. I wish that the needs of Barbados are being borne in mind with the advent of this dental school. Yes, we have a few de dentists here, and including the polyclinic, but the need for volunteerism is really critical in Barbados. Um, I can only hope that this dental school will bring it. Yes, we have a polyclinic that service polyclinics really that service children to almost the fullest extent, and also some cases in the adult population. Unfortunately, the adult population is limited in what we can offer to, to individuals in that maybe cleanings and extractions. Offering her support for the resolution was Minister of Education, Technological and Vocational Training, Kay McConney. She says the dental school will bring additional opportunities for not only international students, but Barbadians. The education minister is also confident the new investment will bring jobs. You need people to clean the place. You need people to be consultants with the place. You need people to be instructors at the place. And while a number of the, we expect that there will be some uh, resources for teaching and instruction that may come from overseas, we expect that we will also be able to use some of our local our local resources to be able to fill some of the opportunities here. The plights of the disabled community and the poor was brought to the fore by Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, Kirk Humphrey, who called attention to the challenges faced in accessing dental care. He sees partnerships as important and made a plea to private dentists and the private sector. I'm calling on the private sector to do a little more because yes, the government has to lead, but the private sector, that is what partnership is about. I'm calling on the private sector, sir, to come forward, to allow persons with disabilities properly registered through the National Disabilities Unit, to accept that they have a legitimate um, registration, and to do something for them. If it is a discount, if they enter into a partnership with the government, so the government carries some of the costs, perhaps at a reduced rate, but there are too many people with disabilities in this country who are dealing with difficult, um, dental issues because they do not have access. And while the, the dental facilities are there, access is more than just having a physical space. Shane, of course, we look forward to hearing more about the dental school and we'll share any additional information with our viewers. Well, thank you, Wendy, for the update there. We look forward to hearing more details about this dental school. Well, we're getting some breaking news. There's a COVID-19 outbreak at the geriatric hospital on Beckles Road in St. Michael. That's according to the Ministry of Health and Wellness, which has advised that as a consequence, visits to Ward 6B have been temporarily suspended. According to the Ministry, four patients have tested positive for the virus. That's between Monday, May 29th and today, Tuesday, June the 6th. The Ministry says it is closely monitoring the situation and measures have been put in place to control the spread of the disease in the hospital. Members of the public will be informed as to when visits will resume on Ward 6B. Any inconvenience caused to family members and friends is deeply regretted. 
While the Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. The Most Honorable Kenneth George, is confident Barbados can meet the December 2025 target to be trans fat free, one of the key responses to combat the non communicable diseases crisis facing the island. Speaking exclusively to CBC News on his return from the World Health Assembly in Geneva, Switzerland, he revealed the, some of the plans to tackle the high incidence of NCDs here. In front of package labeling of, of foods, we believe um, strongly that Barbados can be trans fat free by December 2025 as a means to reducing uh, deaths from cardiovascular disease. Um, we have we have worked with the Ministry of Education with respect to the, um, the school nutrition policy. So I think there are some other big ticket items coming out of the NCD agenda. Dr. George also reveals the Ministry of Health will be working with the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus on a survey to get a more accurate picture of the level of NCDs in the population. Meanwhile, the CMO is looking ahead to a major conference which takes place right here in Barbados later this month. It's the World Health Organization's Small Island Developing States High-Level Technical Meeting on NCDs and Mental Health to be hosted on June 14th and 15th. He highlights his expectations. We are hoping that the outcome of the SITS conference will have concrete um, um, proposals that governments can take up and run with with respect to not only um, investing in climate change and cities, but providing the um, financial and human resources that are necessary to, to continue to fight in the long term. Coming up here on Newsnight, a tourism official shares his thoughts on the cost of regional travel. Intra-regional travel is once again in the spotlight and while increased and new airlift are welcomed, the cost of flying in the region is still way too expensive. Director of Latin America and the Caribbean for the Barbados Tourism Marketing Incorporated, Corey Garrett says, negotiating as a region with air carriers could be considered but would require changes. The issues or the things that we've seen with the taxation rates, which as we do know is forcing the Caribbean, um, the, the price of travel up, is the point-to-point -point tax. There's a tax here in Barbados, there's a tax here in Dominica, there's a tax in St. Vincent, etc. That is added into the ticket. So, simply put, it would be for those who control the taxes to first have an agreement at that level. What I can tell you is that our government, and led by our Prime Minister, has started to look at those type of um, scenarios. Um, it may not be possible across three or four countries, but we have looked at doing it with one or two other countries um, in terms of having a bit of a tax holiday or tax break. And you can watch that full interview on the intra-regional travel crisis, concerns and possible solutions at 8.03 p.m. on In The Know with Crystal Hoyt. The Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, ICA, has welcomed the strides made by regional policymakers in addressing food insecurity. Representative of the ICA Barbados delegation, Alistair Glean, acknowledges, however, that despite the efforts made, some challenges still exist. He shared some insight on the matter during CBC TV8's Morning Barbados. We have a challenge in terms of the economic status of, 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 of most countries and there is a need by consumers to address and, and, and take affordable food. So while we would want to encourage persons to eat what they grow and to source locally, there's a challenge in, in, in getting affordable food. And we have, we have to be realistic and know that for farmers and local producers, at times they cannot meet the demand uh, for food in their particular country. With the International Decade of People of African Descent expected to come to a close in 2024, there is a strident call for a second decade to be declared. The topic was one of many discussed during the recently concluded second session of the United Nations Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. The decade was declared to strengthen actions and measures to ensure the full realization of the economic, social, cultural, civil and political rights of people of African descent. And 
and their full and equal participation in society. Barbados' ambassador to CARICOM, David Comichon, who participated in the forum, revealed it was decided not enough was accomplished and the present decade was not taken seriously. Ambassador Comichon was a guest on Morning Barbados as well in the Conversations on CARICOM segment. The Permanent Forum has said that the second decade must be dedicated to issues pertaining to reparations, um, issues pertaining to deconstructing and undoing the systemic anti-black racism that is embedded in the international arena and in um, national societies around the world, and indeed to implementing the new um, declaration on the promotion protection and full respect for um, the rights of, of people of African descent. The four-day session of the United Nations Permanent Forum on the People of African Descent produced many other conclusions and recommendations. Ambassador Comichon proposed the UN establish a special international tribunal to adjudicate reparations claims. Sports Night, brought to you with the compliments of Great Health Works, agents for Omega XL. Time to take a look at what's happening in the world of sports. Let's go over to Amory now in the sports studio. Megan Best lost her ladies' singles quarterfinal match last night at the 24th Squash Championships in Cartagena, Colombia. Best, who was the last Bajan player left in the singles competition, went down to the USA's Marina Stefanoni at 6-11-6-11-11-9-5-11. Speaking to CBC Sports from Colombia, manager Michael Best described the conditions as very challenging and said it has taken a toll on the players the conditions here uh, in Colombia and Cartagena very hot uh, and humid and uh, not much vent not any ventilation really on the courts the athletes are you know complaining it's uh, very hard to breathe like on the courts um, not only in Barbados athletes but even all the athletes except those who are living in Colombia or close by the like Ecuador or um, those places, they're obviously accustomed to the conditions, so they're adapting slightly better, but it's also hot for them. Obviously, um, when Megan played yesterday and against the top seed, who on the PSA surf is known as the road runner, she's very fit and agile, and um, Megan was able to stay with her and put up a big win there. Obviously, it took a toll on her, and she had to come back maybe in like four hours later to to play another tough opponent in um, Marina Stefanoni from the USA. Obviously still trying to recover, but she lost that one, but still managed to take a game off the, the girl who, um, she didn't have to play in the morning. Her opponent actually um, retired injured after the second game. So, but all in all, very happy. Um, all the rest of the athletes have adapted well. Team Barbados will now turn their attention to the team competition before the doubles starts on Friday. Best believes Barbados should fare a lot better in those categories. We are anticipating good performances from the team there. And then we then move on to doubles, I think Thursday or so close to the weekend. That's where our, our best chances perhaps are of meddling, um, particularly with the ladies. And so we're trying to keep the athletes obviously in uh, recovery mode. We have um, coach Wyler Batron, and he's very experienced at the professional level, so he's going through recovery process with them to keep them in good shape on, until then. Um, so we're very, very optimistic of you know bringing home medal for Barbados at this point in time. The Business Report, brought to you by the Youth Entrepreneurship Scheme, a department of the Ministry of Youth and Community Empowerment, supporting young entrepreneurs from idea to enterprise. In tonight's Yes Business Report, we take a look back at the Barbados Youth Climate Action Summit and also take a glimpse at the new 32-page Yes magazine. Ryan Broom has more. Speaking during the launching ceremony of the summit at the Hilton Barbados, CARICOM Youth Ambassador and UNICEF Youth Advocate Ashley Lashley described climate change as public enemy number one. She says small island states like Barbados are now at the forefront of the climate crisis, facing rising sea levels and extreme weather events which threaten our existence. Ms. Lashley, who is also the head of the Ashley Lashley Foundation, says as future leaders, the youth must play an important role in the ongoing fight against climate change. It is our moral responsibility 
as youth of today to rise above the challenges and make a positive impact on the world. The Ashley Lashley Foundation is delighted this year to be hosting the second edition of the Barbados Youth Climate Action Summit in partnership with the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, which is scheduled to take place from October 18th to the 20th. The Barbados Youth Climate Action Summit is really an environmental campaign which aims to raise awareness and educate students between the ages of 9 to 22 on the ways in which they can engage in climate action. And this three-day event is intended to be held under the team Beyond Talk More Action. She said the second expo of the summit includes a youth environmental job expo, youth consultations, echo tours, and a student climate march. A new feature of this year's summit will be the Eco Tours, which is a practical approach to really highlighting the physical effects of climate change on some of the natural features of Barbados. One of our key focus areas this year will be that of sustainable tourism, also energy conservation and renewable energy, solid waste management, food security and water conservation, and ocean spaces. Through the Barbados Youth Climate Action Summit, we also want to introduce Barbadian youth to global platforms hosting pivotal conversations surrounding climate change. And we are pleased to announce that this year, we will be supporting one young Barbadian to attend the Conference of Parties 28, which will take place in Dubai this coming November. Ms. Lashley also imparted these words of inspiration to young people. It is important for all of our stakeholders who are present here today to understand that our youth are the driving force of change and we hold a unique power, a power to reshape the trajectory of our planet and secure a brighter future for all. It is within our hands to stand up against the destructive practices that contribute to climate change. It is within our hands to amplify the voices of the most vulnerable who bear the brunt of environmental degradation. And it is within our hands to forge a path towards sustainability and resilience where our island Barbados can thrive. Meanwhile, the Yes magazine, which was available at the summit, was officially launched in recent weeks, and the youth ambassador was among the many highlights from the new edition, giving some insight into her advocacy and the foundation. In this new edition, the Include You Sports Academy was also highlighted as a featured business in the magazine. You may recall that the 28-year-old Akeem Rudder is the owner of the academy, which specializes in providing physical education training to people with disabilities. This year's Yes magazine also contains features on Teaser Skincare, Labex Creations, Liquid Designers, and a special spotlight on the Yes Juniors, among others. There's also important information on the Yes Accounting Service Program and more. Now, if you'd like to get a physical copy of the new Yes magazine, just visit the Division of Youth Affairs offices in Haggett Hall, St. Michael. And for the digital version, you can visit the website of the Division of Youth Affairs. For the Yes Business Report, I'm Ryan Broom. In other business news tonight, the Caribbean Telecommunications Union, CTU, supports moves to introduce a complementary currency aimed at addressing the challenges of cross-border currency pay payments across Barbados and the region. Now, complementary currencies are alternative forms of currency that operate alongside a country's legal tender and are confined to specific regions, business networks, or sectors. These currencies can take various forms, including cash, digital, or hybrid mediums, and can be backed by different reserves. Carib Coin, a fintech company, has introduced a Carib Dollar. Founder and Chief Architect at Carib Coin, Dr. Jan Schrauder, says the complementary currency is different from the U.S. dollar as it is regionally bound. So it's designed to support trade between businesses within the Caribbean. The second thing is if you want to do trade, now you have, need a correspondent bank. They're de-risking, so they're leaving the region. There's no risk of Carib dollar leaving the region because it's bound to be in the region. It's made for the region. So we tackle the second problem as well. And the third is a lot of MSMEs, and micro, small and medium-sized enterprises don't have, even have access to banking. And this is something we can change as well. We work together with payment service providers, which are already active in the region, and use their reach out to give access to Carib dollars. 
The CTU, in collaboration with CarbCoin and Abed Ventures, is set to host a webinar to explore the potential of complementary currencies. The webinar, titled Exploring the Potential of Complementary Currency for the Caribbean, will take place tomorrow. Secretary General of the CTU, Rodney Taylor, wants buy-in to the initiative given the value it adds. We encourage uh, the policymakers in the region to attend to understand uh, because you, you mentioned, for example, crypto. And it is important to understand that this is different from, say, Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency that's currently out there. How is it different? We need to be able to build awareness around that and educate um, and explain the safeguards that are in place. And, and from our point of view, that is why we are providing the platform. I mean, Caribcoin is a private company. It is a member of the CTU. Uh, we don't have any stake in the company, but certainly we understand the value of the product that they're trying to, um, to implement in the Caribbean and how it can help to drive our own agenda in terms of digital transformation. We call this one the up and on segment as we go back over to Anne Marie. We're Commonwealth are leading the charge. Let's talk about it. Yes, they are. We're speaking about volleyball. Commonwealth boys are leading the boys zone two, and the girls are second in their their zone two after the latest victories in the National Sports Council's under 16 volleyball league competition. The boys and girls from the law school travel to Waterford to be handed straight sets defeats by the host. Here's a look at both matchups. Let's start with the girls' game. Lodge with the serve and is picked up by Commomere, who responded and then sent back the free pass. Time for Lodge to capitalize, but it said Commomere gifted them the point by hitting into the net. Very next serve, and again the Commomere girls will be left in shambles. But the tables would turn if this serve as Ukela Dalloway, who was at the root of the first two points, served out of court, and this is where the Waterford girls got their act together. Justina Bootman with the serve, and it's knocked out of court. So nice she did it twice, Lodge just not finding the right response. And if you think Bootman had the serving power, watch as Michaela Brathwaite gets in on the act as well. And soon enough, Comer will pull back control of this matchup to take the first set at 25 to 9. Second set now, and Lodge started to inflict the same punishment on the Waterford girls, looking to pull the game level. Here's a fact. Almost all the points gained by either team was clean from serving errors. There were some players that gave us a true volleyball feel. Comer picks it up, sets it up, and then the cross-court kill is delivered. Lodge there looked like they'll be replicating the play, but oh no, they just couldn't complete it. And you pretty much could tell how the script was being written. That's an ace. And let's just call it. Comer girls claimed the second set at 25-6. And that's all they needed to take the win, two sets to nil. On to the boys' game. And again, the opposing team unable to respond to the serve was the order of the day. Eric Wedderburn with the serve. And again, Lodge just not getting it right. There are some volleys that brought excitement like this one. And the Cormier boys had the front of the net on lockdown. Still so yearning for a good volley between the teams. But I'll just have to settle for the points being handed over too easily. Just keep those aces coming and the boys from Waterford won the first set at 25 to 16. Let's see if switching sides would improve play. Lodge picks it up. Nice dig and the free pass is gifted. A little hesitation but they got it together and it falls into front court. More points to the home boys. The Lodge boys had their moment of glory too. This one picked up and set up but instead passed back to their opponents. Commomere, right to make the point there is, but oh no, Shea Jones says not today as he blocks it. Jones then has the serve and the sand clerk hits into the net, Lodge gaining momentum. He then loses the advantage and Commomere will now take the point and service. And this is how the final points will be claimed. Enrico Bourne with the serve, but Lodge could not follow it right through. Bourne goes for it again. This time, however, the boys in blue are looking good with it, but Thierry Weber puts too much power behind it and it's out of court. Hey, Bourne, let's put an ace in the mix. The Comer boys have sealed the deal. The two set win, taking the final one at 25 to 9. 
Now, the Barbados Drafts Association's National Youth Tournament got underway recently at the Lodge Road Drafts Club. Ten participants are vying to become the next young king or queen of the drafts board and will aim to dethrone defending champion Seanel Neverson. A, among them is seven-year-old Aidan Whitaker of Rosettes Primary, who is having his first taste of competition. The youngest competitor in the pack was not daunted as he battled against rivals more than double his age. He was initiated with a 2-0 defeat at the hands of Kyle Jones in his first round, but managed a one-all draw in his second round matchup against Isaiah Prescott. Meanwhile, Neverson got her title defense off to an impressive start by defeating Anita Barry 2-0. Followed that up with a 1-0 victory over Talio Appiah in round 2 and swept aside Adisa Edwards 2-0 in round 3 to top the table on 11 points. She's trailed by Isaiah Prescott and Veronica Barry on 9 points. The tournament continues on Sunday. And that's our time for this edition of CBC News Live. I'm Shane Seeley. Good night. Thanks for visiting us. Now, if you want to see more stories like this one, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can always go to cbc.bb for the latest news and current affairs.